Hello, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of the Business Talk Library, and today I have another guest on. Now, usually we have entrepreneurs and business owners on, but one of the things that we all know is that, you know, entrepreneurship and business ownership and running a business, it's not just something that happens in a bubble. There are so many different things that play a role in it, and one of the greatest areas is what you get from the educational system, especially when it comes down to accounting and finance. So we have a great professor on, Dr. Edward, who is a professor at Winthrop University in accounting, is on the show. And we're going to talk about his role in, in accounting. We're going to talk about you know, his history, his background, and his role as a professor. So welcome to the show, Dr. Edward. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Now, before we jump into, you know, your role as a professor, kind of what was your background before, you know, coming on as a professor? Well, um, so uh, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, so I am from a native of, of, of Mississippi, Meridian, Mississippi. Um, so before becoming an academic, I spent uh, 14 years uh, before in, in, in industry. Uh, I spent my initial I would say the first half of my career uh, for uh, working for a public company, actually it was a medical pathology company that was, uh, that was absorbed by, uh, that's, that's, the, that's a, a nice way of saying it. It was absorbed <laughs> by, uh, by LabCorp. Uh, and so I enjoyed that job. And, and the, the interesting part about it is I spent probably more time learning more about database administration than I did actual accounting work. Uh, but I was exposed to uh, some of the more uh, technical nuanced areas of accounting, such as derivatives, interest rate swaps, foreign currency translation, um, things that, that honestly I wasn't, I didn't see uh, as much in, in, uh, in my, my prior training, but uh, as a student, but I, I enjoyed that job. And then I actually did probably the reverse, whereas you see individuals that will typically start out in public accounting and then realize that they don't want to have anything else to do with it. I actually left that job and went to public accounting, spent about three and a half years there, a local regional firm there in Meridian, Mississippi, and learned a lot. And I say that really, that's really where I got my education in accounting. I think public accounting, I, I would say there really is no substitute uh, for the training that, that you get there. And, and it was a small firm. And uh, the, the benefit of that is that I learned the entire picture from start to finish. I learned about the, the intricate linkages between the individual and the firm. And I looked at so many different types of entities, S corporations, partnerships, um, C corporations, um, uh, how do we go about or what's the most tax advantageous way of transitioning from one entity to the next? Um, and so um, that experience, I think, is, is, is what really stuck with me. And then I moved from that to, uh, to well, three and a half years of that. And I was just, I, I could not, uh, I could not maintain. Uh, it, it's, it's good, it's good for, it's in terms of learning, but I realized that public accounting was, was not my, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so I uh, worked for a, 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 a publicly traded uh, organization, actually the largest shell egg. When I say that, um, basically the, the easiest way to describe that is the eggs that you eat, um, crack, scramble, all that. They are the largest, right? Okay. A billion dollar organization. I was the manager of financial reporting. So um, I prepared the 10Ks, the 10Qs, um, did, did the SEC reporting. That was my role, the manager of, 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 of financial reporting. And so did that for seven years officially as an employee. And then once I went into um, my PhD program, I guess it's an open secret. I, I probably wasn't supposed to say this, but I actually did it again uh, a, a year into my PhD program uh, on a contract basis. I think they were uh, uh, the, the conversation that the CFO had, to me, had with me when he said, when he realized I was going into academia, he was like, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, there's no, why in the world would you want to do this? You know, um, he said, uh, and again, you know, it's just one of those things where I just said, well, I just, I, I, during the time that I was the, the manager of financial reporting, I had an opportunity to do some adjunct teaching. 
And I just love, I fell in love with it. Even when I was in public accounting, I, I wanted to teach. And the individual that I, I still consider a dear friend, he was always advocating for me to not pursue that. But once I did it, I realized that, you know, I always just, and again, if it, again, I'm not going that far back, but even back in high school, a lot of the, my, a lot of the, the, my peers were saying, Charles, you need to be a teacher. And I just kind of ran from it and ran from it and ran from it. And once I did it, I was like, you know, they were right. That's what, this is what I really want to do. <laughs> now, so when you have those conversations with, like I said, some of the people that, you know, tried to steer you away from teaching, were, what were some of the reasons that they kind of gave as to why you shouldn't go down that path? Well, uh, again, I don't want to offend any of my academic friends, uh, <laughs> but you know, there's that age old uh, cliche, you know, those who can do those who can't teach, you know? Gotcha. And, and so that was really uh, the crux of what a lot of them were saying. They were like, Charles, you're really, really good at actually doing. So why would you want to do this full time? Um, uh, definitely, uh, from a, from a compensation standpoint, probably would have done a whole lot better to remain outside of academia. But you just kind of you know wake up one day and and just kind of say what's what's you know what's the purpose of my life you know and and what do I really want to or or what lasting impact do I really want to have? Is it about having the biggest bank account or any of those things? And you just kind of, those conversations are tough. They're real. I mean, uh, I, you know, I grew up in, in, I'm just going to, people that know me, I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, in poverty. So, you know, having, the, you know, that high compensation was, was, was important. But then again, you just kind of think about, you know, at what point are you, are you going to sacrifice who you truly are just for a paycheck? You know, and I, and I said, well, I don't, I don't want to continue to do that. And plus I have two kids now and just trying to want to set a good example for them, mm -hmm. you know, of, of what really is important. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now that brings me to something that I, I saw because the way we got connected is I saw something that you had posted on, on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. what I really liked about it because, you know, occasionally when I, you know, especially during grad school, when I went to, we would study some of the research papers. And one of the biggest challenges that I always had with the research that the PhD accountants were doing is I'm like, when you think about this as a practitioner, like this is so over their head. But mm -hmm. what I liked about, you know, the conversation we were having is about, you know, being able to still keep the mindset of a practitioner when you're actually doing your research like well how did that kind of that mindset for you kind of come about and just kind of how does that play a role in how you approach research well i like to think about like the the paper i just i recently had a paper that is approved for publication that should have come out later this this year that deals with critical audit matters and and how commercial lending officers uh, make a decision based on receiving that disclosure. And, and the way I view uh, the research is, I always view it through the lens of, so again, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to say things in a nice way. So uh, <laughs> forgive me if, if I stum, uh, you know, stammer and stummer. So I, I don't, because uh, I know this is going to be released on YouTube. So I don't want to, you know, <laughs> want people to, you know, do anything. Anyway, uh, so uh, from that perspective, I always view it through the lens of someone that has 14 years of experience. And I always, because, and again, you know, through the PhD program, you are exposed to a lot of uh, very, very, very intelligent people, people that, that I just like, wow, this person is very, very intelligent. I remember at, at one of the PhD project conferences, um, I would say my first conference, my very first PhD project conference. Um, again, I'm not going to name names. Uh, uh, I don't want to do that to the individuals, but they were talking about things, talking about statistics. And I was just like, what in the, <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking about. Like, is this, is this really accounting? You know, what, you know, what have I gotten myself into? But it, it even with all of that, I still can't, as I started doing my own research, I realized, of course, ultimately I realized I was worthy and, and uh, subsequently I, I learned how to understand all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, I, I just view it through the lens of, 
would I appreciate reading this? Would this inform anything that I was about to do as a practitioner? And to be honest, some of the research is, is great. Um, very, very, um, again, you have the exposure, you've, you've seen it. Some of it is, is a, a lot of, um, a lot of very detailed, very comprehensive numerical analysis. But as a practitioner, um, you, you're looking at it, especially in a public accounting context, it is how can I, how can I derive meaning from this if I have a client before me? And in some cases, in a lot of is is again, it's, it's, it's not to say, it, I'm trying to not to say anything overtly negative against the research. Mm -hmm. It's just that in a lot of cases, that research might not be applicable in that particular context. And the impact of the research now, the impact of it I see is, is in terms of as educators, we think differently about these accounting topics. And so we are teaching the students in, in, a, in, a, better, in a better way. And so there's an indirect impact, but the, the immediacy of it. So when the research is immediately produced and you, you see things like, you know, these discretionary accruals, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and these statistical models, and you think, how in the world would, would, this, <laughs> would this individual that's working on this tax return or working on this audit use this in this particular case? Um, and I think it's, it's just that, that there is a disconnect. We're trying to make, we're trying to find some common ground. Mm -hmm. I don't know, again, uh, my opinion is anecdotal. Okay. Uh, and so uh, based on my experience, I don't know if there is a way that we're going to get there soon. I think maybe at some point uh, we, we might, but as I think about my own research, it's more along the lines of, so when I look at critical audit matters and how that would impact lenders, it's more of thinking about if we're going to, if we're going to have the auditors now provide this additional disclosure, then are we indirectly an unintended consequence is are we now indirectly penalizing companies just by the mere fact of satisfying a regulation. And so that's really the crux of the research. Mm -hmm. And so as an account, as, as a, as a practitioner, you can think of, this is this this might be has making them think about so when I prepare this critical audit matter disclosure, research such as this would make me think about what exactly am I going to identify as a critical audit matter, and those stakeholders, how are they going to view the information that I'm essentially mandated to disclose, and so. It's a very complex uh, dynamic existing now with that, that separation between, you know, academia and, and the practitioner community. We're trying to make it better. Um, I think there are many, uh, many of us that think like me that we're trying to find a way to communicate through our research, you know, how this can be very useful to the practitioner community. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a, a, a ongoing thing because even from, being in practice, one of the early things that I realized when I was working for a couple of Fortune 500 companies to where the accounting and finance team, they would, you know, do these deep analysis, some on uh, an analyzing long-term contract accounting. And mm -hmm. they would have this nice report at the end, and then they would hand it to a salesperson or the VP who was over like the commercial business. And he would look at it and he'd say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And it was one of those things that I'm like, if a practitioner holds it in their hands and they look at it and say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Then it tells me that, you know, even in practice, there's some opportunity for me to actually, you know, connect the dots from their world and my world a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 
And I think one of the areas that, you know, as a professor where you probably experience this a lot because, you know, you dive deep into some of your subject matters from a research standpoint, but then when you're teaching your students where they're not at that level yet to grasp that, like, how do you bridge that gap or do you find it a challenge at time bridging the gap between what you know and what you can teach? That that's one of those mistakes that that I think is is common early on in your teaching career. I mean, I've been teaching goodness. Uh, I'm, I don't want to date myself. I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> dating myself. Um, I'm much older than I appear, but uh, probably I've been teaching, you know, goodness over a decade. And so early on there, there is that tendency to you think that there's going to be that appreciation of, you know, how much of this stuff that I know and you realize quickly um, you know, the dynamics of communication is, is that um, in order for me to officially communicate to you, I have to send you a message and the person receiving that message has to understand. And so if it's just me sending you a bunch of information, but you're not understanding anything I'm telling, to, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that I'm not communicating with you. And so it's just understanding that dynamic and, and really meeting the students where they are. Uh, and so... Um, and really focusing on what exactly is absolutely essential. And I, and I think once I had that breakthrough in terms of even, because again, over my 14 years, uh, I will tell you, and when, when I initially went into public accounting, um, I will say two weeks in, I never, you know, tell most people that, so I guess now I'm telling the world. Um, but so two weeks in, uh, I was ready to quit. I mean, I, I, you know, because it, it was so much, I mean, it's it, because again, it was a small, it was a regional firm. And so it was not only seeing, you know, just the, you know, you have the, the financial reporting, you know, your debits, credit stuff, but now I'm dealing with uh, individual taxation. And I'll tell you that from my undergraduate experience, I think everyone that took my, un, my, my, uh, uh, Dr. Enos, you're great. I'll say that. Uh, <laughs> but everyone that took that, the, the, uh, the, inter, the, the, the individual taxation course, we all walked away. I'm never doing taxes ever, ever. <laughs> and so uh, the fact that I, I had to do that on top of, of, of business taxation and then you're uh, then dealing with nonprofits, these 990s, and then dealing with the, the state tax issues. And then in two weeks, I was just like, I have to learn all this stuff. I was like, I, I can't do it. You know, it's like, again, it's like, and you know, you have that moment where, and I think that I try to think about that in terms of, of, of the students. And so uh, again, my goal is not to demonstrate to them all that I know, because I know that would overwhelm them because I know I, I had the similar experience of working and just being overwhelmed what, with the amount of work that I had to do and really the, the amount of learning that I had to, to, to do. I stuck with it for three and a half years and I consider myself, you know, good at it, but, I, but that experience sticks with me and I, and I, and I, and I, I try my best not to, to, uh, to create an environment where students have that similar experience in my course. And so it's about, looking at the material and a lot of it is complex it's pretty dense but but dissecting and 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 realizing what exactly is the most essential element that the student needs to know right there's a lot of detail but the detail can be filled in easily once you understand the big picture i'm more of a you know uh of, you know, not getting lost, you know, in the forest for the trees. So I try to, you know, look at, you know, what's the big picture? What's the overriding theme? Teach the theme and then the details as we come across those, those more in, important details that you just absolutely have to learn, right? You don't want to graduate. You don't want to send students out of your, your accounting program that don't know what a debit or credit is or don't know the differences between current assets, long-term assets, or current liabilities, long-term liabilities, and, and thinking about um, from that perspective of how, first of all, in accounting, is you, you think first from a financial reporting mm -hmm. perspective of how exactly is the user going to use this information? And is this information accurate? 
And so once you, what, with me, I try to frame the thinking. Think about it in those terms first, right? So as an accountant, when you're preparing that, that information, preparing that, uh, that financial statement or even a tax return, think about it from the perspective of is it painting or communicating a clear picture of that organization? Think about that first. Once we know that, then we start thinking about the D, then we start digging into the details. How can we go about based on the detailed analysis of, so right now my intermediate class, uh, we dealt with uh, PP&E, uh, property plan and equipment, uh, using accounting lingo. Uh, so, so once you, you know that and those, those intricacies of, of depreciation, right? Typically it's straight line, but is that really capturing how that asset is being used or being used up, right? Is it truly capturing that, um, the using up of that asset? And the reason why we, we, we do that is because, again, it's a long-term, it's an operational asset is being used by the organist by that by that business for operating por uh, purposes and in accord with the this one i then start start throwing in some of those things they may have forgotten the matching principle right uh, we're trying to match the revenues with expenses and so a consequence if it's an operating asset then what, what we want to do is we want to match the fact that this asset which is being used for operational purposes it's a long term asset it's being used for a long period of time we want to match the using up a portion of that asset that's being used up over this period with the revenue that it helped generate so again just kind of taking a step by step approach not to try to you know get all you know mathy i think some people again i've been around some certain individuals you know that want to communicate how intelligent they're they are and probably <laughs> and again i'm just going to be honest i probably made the same mistake early on in my career but i've been teaching long enough to realize that you're only serving a party of one when you do gotcha. that it's it's about making sure um are the students better after they leave your class or do they come away from your class just thinking that's a very intelligent person i didn't learn anything <laughs> but he's very smart and so i you know that's the dynamic that that that, that that's at play when i teach I'm, I'm about i'm focused on am i making that student better as opposed to i'm gotcha. um, having a student walk away saying oh dr randall is so intelligent that's that doesn't <laughs> uh, yeah that doesn't serve anyone uh, in my opinion gotcha and speaking of that what classes do you teach at the university level uh, right now, I'm teaching a, a graduate uh, accounting for managers class uh, at the MBA level, and I'm teaching intermediate accounting two, and I'm teaching a principles of managerial accounting course. Awesome. Awesome. Now, before we wrap up, one question that I'd like to, to always ask, because um, most of our guests are going to be um, uh, business owners and those that are in the practice of business. When you think about your practical experience, um, is there any advice that you would give to someone who's running a business when it comes to how well or how much they should actually invest the time to understand their financial statements? Like what kind of advice would you give to them in that area? I would say, and this is the same story. I, I hope I can do it quickly. Uh, so I'm trying to think of how I can say this in a concise way. Uh, I would say, again, you should focus on making sure that you're delivering a product that the customer wants to wants to a product or service that the customer wants right so that's that's priority number one but i would say in terms of organizing your time that should be number one but the second is your financial statements the financial statements are telling a story right that's what the financial statements are, are telling you they're telling you it's just like um it's, it, to me I, I see financial statements as 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 a novel right it's, it's telling you what is going on with your business? And so you really need to make sure that, which is why I, I sometimes don't understand why organizations want to, want to cheat or want to falsify financial statements, right? It, it doesn't make sense. You, you, you want the truth. And if those financial statements, if done in an ethical way, in a correct way, they are telling you the truth of what's going on with your business. And once you know that, you can then think about uh, what do I need to prove, uh, improve? Where do I need to 
what, what, are the, what are the challenges with this organization? And you can use those financial statements for benchmarking purposes. I always um, use as an example, for instance, you're, you might be a small enterprise, right? You may be a, uh, your organization might be 0.01% the size of Walmart, but you, you have a little small independent department store. And so you have an opportunity to use, uh, again, I don't want to get overly technical, uh, but you can use vertical analysis, right? You can convert Wal Walmart's financial statements into these ratios, and then you can take your uh, your financial statements, use vertical analysis, convert your financial statements into these series of ratios based on, say, if it's the income statement as, as, a, per, as a percentage of sales, and, and just make a comparison and say, this is what Walmart is able to do given their size. This is what I'm able to do. Are there any significant abnormalities, right? So just doing things like that will help you as a business owner understand where are those areas where if I am in this particular industry and my goal is to succeed in this particular industry, those financial statements are telling you where you're going wrong and it's telling you the things you should do more of. And so that's, uh, that's how I view financial statements is that it's, you need them, they're critical and they are telling you a story. It's just about, you know, are you willing to listen to that, to that story? Just like most things. We, sometimes we don't like to hear the truth. Sometimes the, uh, uh, again, funny story is, uh, back even in my days in public accounting, is uh, there was, we had an individual, had an interesting business. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it was a horrible business. I mean, absolutely horrible. And so um, he and I, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so I was going over his financial statements and he just kind of had, a, I guess, an epiphany so to speak. And, um, you know, I'm still going through the numbers and I realized he wasn't listening to a thing I was saying. He said, I have a horrible business, don't I? Right. Um, I'm just using clean language. And uh, I said, yep. I mean, again, I, I mean, there, there was no way to, again, that was the truth. I mean, what the, I, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but, but the financial statements were, were, were basically, we had the one-on-one -on -one for me to translate the information to him, but the, but everything that was going on with his business was being told to him every single time that he received those financial statements. So it's just about taking the time to understand what those statements are telling you. Wow, definitely. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I guess if you're watching or you're listening, I mean, I, I think that at, Dr. Randall said it best. I mean, your financial statements are going to tell you a story you might or might not like the story that it's telling you, but it will give you the truth. So Dr. Randall, thank you so much for coming on to the show mm -hmm. and for sharing. We'll definitely um, add a link so people can um, find you. Also, yeah, one question that I, I forgot to ask that I always do ask is, now people are looking for some of the material that you share online or with, whether your articles um, or on social media, where can they find you online? Uh, I mean, I am on LinkedIn and, but again, Winthrop University website, just look up Dr. Well, it's going to be Edward Charles Randall. And so you have your contact information, uh, open book, contact, send me an email. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Dr. Randall, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for tuning in to the Business Talk Library. If you like what you heard and you want to hear more, be sure to click the subscribe button and follow us on all social media platforms as the Business Talk Library.